photo. Welcome everyone. It's a real pleasure to welcome you all to this session this evening. We are the River, an exploration of Indigenous food sovereignty and the legal personality of nature in Aotearoa, New Zealand. My name is Olivia and I'll be introducing this evening's session. My father comes from Aotearoa, New Zealand. He's a Pākehā descendant of mostly English settlers. Through him, I am descended from farmers and fisher folk from the Lizard in Kurno, right down the bottom of England, and further north, from lace workers and gardeners in Nottinghamshire. My mother comes from Turtle Island, a descendant of European settlers from many lands, from the UK, France and Germany, from flax farmers from Ireland, indentured farm labourers from the Netherlands, and Kirsch distillers from Switzerland. I grew up all around the world, from Guatemala to Sri Lanka, Mexico to Russia, before we finally moved back to New Zealand when I was 11. Once we got to Aotearoa, we moved around some more. First we lived in Whakatū, Nelson, and then in Tamaki Makoto in Auckland. And for uni, I moved to Otautahi in Christchurch, and then at last to Te Whanganui Atara, Wellington. And now I live in Oxford in England. I come from all these different lands, and my heart belongs to each of them in different ways. And it's the different relationships between people and the land that our three wonderful panellists are here to talk about tonight. Erin Matariki Ka, Catherine Irons Magallanes, and Tami Iti. Catherine is a professor of law at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand, and she's also my former supervisor. She has more than 25 years experience in Indigenous rights, environmental law, international law, and statutory interpretation. She's received several awards for her environmental law teaching and research. She has particular interests in the future of food and has written on pesticides regulation. She's the academic advisor to the New Zealand Council of Legal Education, a member of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, and New Zealand's nominee to the IUCN Governing Council. She's also a member of the International Law Association Committee on the Implementation of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a trustee of River, and a board member of the New Zealand Centre for Global Studies. Wow, <laughs> go Kathy. Erin <laughs> Matarikika is of Naituhoi and Natiawa descent and currently lives in Taniatua, just north of Teotawera Rainforest in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Erin is a lawyer and believes in reconnection to Papatuanuku through everyday actions as a means to decolonisation for self and community. And for those of you out there who don't speak Māori, Papatuanuku is Mother Earth. Erin is co lead of River, a non profit seeking to revitalise Indigenous values for Earth's regeneration, and a co manager of the New Zealand Alternative, a non profit organisation creating informed public debate relating to New Zealand's place and foreign policy in this changing world. And last but certainly not least, Tami Iti is a prominent Tuhoi Komatua and internationally known activist and artist. Tami grew up in the Ruatuki Valley, north of Tiruweta Rainforest. Tame's belief is that mana motuhaki, self-determination, begins at home. Having sovereignty over your food and growing your own garden connects you with papatuaniku, with your whānau, your family, and is an active practice of mana motuhaki. But that's enough from me now. I'll hand over to our speakers. Over to you, Kathy. Um, thanks very much, um, Olivia. Um, so uh, I would normally, you know, start with a Māori mihi um, and, you know, thank uh, everybody for um, letting me speak here. Um, it's not an order of I'm not the most senior going first. I'm simply setting the scene. And so we thought we would start with um, an explanation of the wider uh, the oh, an example and the concept of using legal personality for nature and then moving down uh, or, or illustrating that in practice and uh, with um, Aaron and Tame's um, discussions of tūhoi, te uruwera and food sovereignty. So um, I start with personality for nature in New Zealand because it's this wonderful tool um, that uh, we have implemented and the world over has 
actually come to look at what we've done uh, and sort of lauded this idea of, oh my goodness, we've made nature a legal person. How does that work and what does it look like? And you know, how, how might we, we be implementing it? What might it mean? So there's all these interesting questions I'm going to um, touch on, but particularly use one example. So here's a a slide with some takeaways in case you know we get caught up in the example but just to remind you uh, at a big picture level what we're looking about when we make legal when we make nature a legal person in Aotearoa New Zealand it has been not something we've done for environmental protection reasons that's very interesting and very important it's for indigenous justice reasons um, it's a human rights reparations process that we've implemented here and that has what is accorded legal personhood for nature and in doing so we've implemented an indigenous guardianship framework uh, and um, yeah and, and tool and as a result we've changed us the status of nature and our mindset we now don't own nature uh, in, the, in, the, in these examples where we've implemented legal personality, we've let nature own itself in law as well as in mind. So it's very different from our current status and mindset, and I'll come back to that. So let me give you first an example, and this is one, this is not Te Urawera, which I'll leave for Erin and Tame, but I'm going to... Um, uh, give one of what we the Whanganui River, and it's been given its own name, Te Awa Tupua. So I'm going to start with this map, and you'll see there the map of the North Island uh, of um, Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, or the fish of Maui. Uh, and in the middle uh, of the island are some volcanic mountains, Tongariro, Ngārua, Hui, and Ruapehu. And the river you can see starts up from the top of one of them and winds its way down and comes out at the coast of Whanganui. And it's New Zealand's longest navigable river, and it passes through the traditional territory of a number of Whanganui um, tribes, often called iwi, uh, here. And in 2017, the New Zealand Parliament, through a statute, made the Whanganui River a legal person and gave it its name, Te Awa Tupua. So it's not uh, something that's come up through courts and in some passes of the parts of the world, but we passed a statute. And I'll come to why in a minute. But before we look at a background, let's... It's a very beautiful river um, that flows through different types of territory. At its upper reaches is the Whanganui National Park. And you can see um, uh, very looking very sort of uh, untouched uh, human habitation in that sense there. It also flows through a lot of farmland, um, which uh, particularly has been cleared through settlement. Um, and uh, as the the longest navigable river in the country. Uh, it's used a lot for kayaking and canoeing, tourists particularly today, um, you know. Um, but it's also, I should say, it's also a road through that area. You can see the type of terrain and country. You know, New Zealand is a country that's been lifted up through volcanic activity um, on the edge of two tectonic plates, and so it's very rough. So it makes an excellent road for transport. And uh, Māori have been using that uh, for transport um, since their establishment up and down the river. And this here's just a painting that we happen to have on, you know, public usage and from the 1800s. But um, that's very important to the Māori um, usage and connection with the river, um, even still today. So uh, the traditional, un, in, within Māori cosmology, the river is central to the existence of their Māori, they treat it as their ancestor, as you gen genuinely think of them being descended from the river. And so uh, they have the saying that, it's a, the saying ko o te awa, ko te awa ko o, the transliteral, uh, I guess the transliteration, the literal meaning, I am the river and the river is me. But of course, words don't just mean their literal meaning. They really get at the fact that the health and the well-being of the river is intrinsically connected with the health and well-being of the people themselves. And so the people are inseparable from the river. If they're not healthy, um, no, if, they, if the river's not healthy, they're not healthy and vice versa. Um, so... 
the oops sorry that didn't show the um in terms of the history the as a result of colonization and um, we say the control of the crown a lot of activities that took Māori control um, of the river away from them um, and undertook activities like riverbed works, gravel extraction, including water diversion, and I can get into that in a minute, um, but they all occurred uh, over you know, more than 100 years and uh, at, against the will of the various tribes that lived up and down the river. And objections had been lodged by um, the tribes, including numerous court cases, and um, they regard the grievances over the river um, as New Zealand's longest running court case, um, with some being lodged there since 1938. Uh, well, I mean, as an example of one of the grievances, which we might not usually we might not have thought of, is right at the beginning of the up near the headwaters, there are Two, two rivers, um, and they've been diverted for a hydroelectric power station, and they've joined two rivers into one. Now, that uh, under, if you think your river's an ancestor, you've just had its spirit completely violated. Um, it's been joined with another body. I mean, you can't imagine, you know, two heads and, and you know, two people independently being physically merged into one. And so that violates um, the Māori cosmology. And that's part of the grievances. You just don't treat a river in this way, as well as you know, ruining um, their way of life and their ability to sustain themselves, ruin their food sovereignty from the way they sustain themselves um, on the rivers. So in as a result of um, New Zealand and government and people agreeing that these grievances are something that should be resolved um, for you know the, the, the health of the country uh, and the communities. Then the government agreed um, and iwi agreed to negotiate over these historical grievances um, in the 2010s, particular. I mean they've been doing it for a while, but they are a fresh round of negotiations. And as a result um, of this fresh round of negotiations, um, the Crown agreed, to recognize the river as an ancestor and make it a I'm oh, sorry, I keep not putting my not putting my um my my <laughs> my arrows. Sorry about that. So here's the, the the PowerPoints, I mean the the words that go with what I've been saying. So they agreed to make the river a legal person, let it own its own property so nobody owns the river and instead people are guardians of the river and that is what has been um, uh, uh, agreed to in the statute that I mentioned. So here's a statement about the river itself. So Te Awa Tupua comprises the Whanganui River as an indivisible and living whole from the mountains to the sea including tributaries and all its physical and metaphysical elements. So this is a statute Right, that it recognizes the metaphysical element, the spirit of the river in law. So it's both physical and spiritual. Um, the agreement uh, also said we're going to put Kōtiawa, Kōtiawa Kōo, into the legislation, um, and they've got that in Section 13. You have that inalienable connection with and responsibility to the river and its health and well-being. Um, so, oh, so the 2012 agreement rec said that what they would do is, I think I've got this out of order, it, they would recognise the entity with a standing in its own right, that it was incapable of being owned, and that the innate values of the river will be recognised and provided for. Again, very important, it goes, it's not just the science about like water testing, it's there's values involved that may not just be physical, for example. Catherine, um, excuse yes. me. Sorry, so sorry to interrupt. We've had some requests that you go into presenter mode on your PowerPoint that you thought, uh, hit the. I thought I was in present. I mean, like that. Yeah, I am. Oh, I maybe it's the wrong screen. I'm really sorry. Maybe it's the wrong screen that's being shared. Oh, perhaps that's that's a problem. You, you could. So what it is then is I've probably got different. So maybe, yeah, I don't know how to change that in the middle of the presentation without ex, without exiting it. I'm really sorry for that. Um, I've got the two screens, and I've got the one of them showing on the right. So when it okay. goes into the presenter, yeah, mode, you you would have to pull down your screen share and reshare and make sure you select the right screen. 
Right. Okay. So, would you like me to end show? Okay. And Olivia says it's it's uh, find the way it is. It, it, really sorry. I no, thought was I was being so clever. <laughs> <laughs> there were two screens and, we're all doing um, what we can it's okay yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. i and, like this yeah. i do and um, yeah so clever showing two screens and we've got all the big pictures on one and you weren't seeing it <laughs> okay um so i tell you what i can do is i can make that much bigger that's that helpful better? that's helpful thank you yeah um so we have the statute now Resume slide, sorry. We have a statute um, which recognises exactly that. The river is a legal person and has all the rights, powers, duties and liabilities of a legal person, just like a company, for example. However, I mean, for some purposes, it is treated as a body corporate, yet interestingly, for other purposes, it's a public entity. Um, and I, do, I should note that the title to the riverbed vests in Te Awatupu in the river itself, but not the water. Water subject to political disagreements about how that you know whether anyone even owns it. Um, so we're just putting the water itself aside, but the river is a sort of a body as a concept, um, as I, I owns itself. And there's a lot of other statutes that are affected by this one. Um, so uh, what it does, you know, it implements a guardianship. I'm going to get rid of that little. Thing there. It implements a kaitiakitanga, is the Māori word for a guardianship model, recognises their concept and has appointed two guardians to the office of what they call te po tupu. It's like the guardianship pole, if you think of a totem pole in that sense. Um, the, the guardian has to promote the, and protect the health and well-being of Te Awa Tupua, to act and speak on its behalf, act in its interests, and consistently with its values, or Tupua Tikawa. Um, and so those two people at the moment, there's a, a one appointed from the Crown and one appointed from the tribes. The tribe, the various, um, the, I think there's eight the, up and down the river, they get together and agree on one po, um, they appointed for three years, and then they choose another, they choose other guardians. Um, so it can rotate around the various different tribes. Um, it's supported by an advisory group. Um, and I think particularly interestingly, there's a big strategy group. Some people wonder, is this just a Maori body? But no, we have a strategy group with 17 stakeholder representatives, which include all the different iwi up and down the river and local and central government representatives, conservation groups, recreation, uh, and other user groups, including tourism, and of course, the big electricity generator. The government's also are given $30 million for the health and well-being of the river. Um, and they're, uh, oh, sorry, which is designed to make sure that, you know, it, it's cleaned and, and flowing well. Um, I want, so if you bring it back to what is this doing, there's a key focus on responsibilities here. And so a lot of people talk about rights of nature. We don't, we haven't seen it as a rights-based approach at all. It's a responsibility. We have cultural redress targeting the Māori grievances and their right to practice their culture and uphold their cosmology. We also, interestingly, have intrinsic worth of the river recognised in law, right? Um, and we've got this transfer of property to enable, with co-governance between Crown and Tribe, to enable these responsibilities to be exercised. Um, so I think those two key points um, that are most important as, is, are the responsibility framework and that the, any rights involved are Indigenous human rights, rights of reparations and cultural rights. Um, so this might, my arrow is not going now, but that's all right. Um, so that if you stand back even further, there we're not New Zealand's not the only country to have recognised um, or to have uh, uh, implemented legal personality or recognised that as a concept. Everyone's got a different base for it, though. And so some people have got, um, like some people have got a rights base and a human in Ecuador, for example, particularly in um, Colombia, we have a human rights and, a, and rights of nature base. Um, we've got a responsibility base, India. Um, oh, India's also got constitutional duties, right? Um, and sometimes, and you may do it through legal personhood or through legal guardianship, 
which could be at such a permanent body such as our one, or it could be through legal representation as in Ecuador and, or the USA, where you might appoint legal standing and anyone can come and say, I want to represent the interests of that river, that mountain, whatever, you know, that forest. Um, you may do it through a court or statute. In terms of a method, we've chosen statute. That's the way our system works, uh, parliamentary sovereignty system. Um, and uh, But we, what we have done is imposed explicit duties for current and future generations. And particularly, all of these recognize a new relationship with nature, and in our case, an ancestral relationship. So I just want to think of that, bring that back to what does that mean for the bigger picture view of um, ideas and mindsets and then how it might link um, to sovereignty and food sovereignty. And so if you take an ancestral relationship, you, say you have this idea of kinship. And I thought, here's a, here's a quote from, uh, one of, uh, from our Waitangi Tribunal about kinship. And here it refers to right, a broad web of relationships. And in the Māori view, that includes relationships between living and dead people and land, water, flora and fauna, and the spiritual world. So a person's inner life force is intimately linked to the Māori or the spirit of others. That includes human and non-human, right, to whom we're all related. So that is why the tribes refer to mountains, rivers, and lakes in the same way as they would refer to humans and why that might speak directly to them. And so what that means for a kinship bond is those duties of care. Um, that's expressed in the word kaitiakitanga, mostly translated as guardianship. But it's more than just, say, stewardship. It's that actual responsibility of a community to your relations. Um, and it's a bit like having a, an obligation or a responsibility to look after your grandparents, even if you wouldn't say they have a right to be looked after. Right? So that's very different. This indigenous view is very different from what we would call the Greco-Christian view, right? Where plants are created for the sake of animals, animals for the sake of men is this, you know, the Greco view, right? Where everything is for our use, <laughs> Right, and it's not for it, nothing for its own sake. That these things were put on the earth to serve us. The Bible, particularly, says that you know, apparently, God has decreed that every moving thing shall be basically for you, whether it's meat, you know, um, it's like fear of humans shall be on every beast and fowl, and everything that moveth shall be delivered into your hands, right? And that has actually formed the basis of our relationship with nature. Uh, it forms the basis of, of relationship in law as well. Blackstone um, in his commentaries forms the basis of our property law. And he has this quote as um, basically the creator gave to men dominion over all of the earth, over the fish, the fowl of the air, the every living thing that moveth. That is the solid and true foundation of man's dominion right, uh, over or external things, whatever metaphysical notions may have been started by fanciful writers. That is the basis of our property laws. So if you change the way you relate to nature, you don't think you're the, you know, you have dominion like this, then you think you have responsibility. That changes your mindset completely, which underpins all of the laws and behaviors. Um, and so then you have I mean, it's not just Maori tribes, um, indigenous, other indigenous tribes have sayings like this one, which shows you don't own nature, right? Where the four-leggeds are our older brothers. We came from them, so you can't own the buffalo. Um, so that, that's why we've made it so we, uh, we, nature can own itself. Um, so if you, you, you link that to indigenous environmental justice goals in New Zealand, and so we get historical reparations, as we've seen with these statutes, you get then political goal of controlling and sharing and decision making. You have a cultural goal, respecting indigenous culture. You also have individual goals with procedural and substantive citizenship or sovereignty justice. Um, and so from an indigenous perspective, you can only achieve justice, so you, when you're linking your human rights goals with this commitment to protect Indigenous peoples within their traditional lands, i.e. upholding sovereignty. 
So Indigenous, the New Zealand examples that we've got here of legal personality for nature are implementing these ideas of Indigenous justice, upholding Indigenous cosmologies and using that, coming out with that as a result. So I've just got a couple more pictures. Um, so I want to think about this justice, which includes in terms of, you know, whether it's food, uh, food justice um, or in for people or for nature. It's all it's only about what we value, right? The kind of society that we regard as just. Um, if we don't want this kind of society, we may need to go have a different mindset, this loading screen, one of my favorite slides, so um, evocative. Uh, then we may need to be thinking about whether it's a rights framework, but thinking putting environment first as, say, a first right or as a primary responsibility. I personally think responsibility is the invisible goal um, of rights. So I'm going to leave it there as a background, um, as introduction with Ko'o Te Awa, Ko Te Awa Ko'o. I am the river and the river is me and we need to all have a mindset like that. Kia ora tato, and I'd love love to hand it over now to Erin and Tame to illustrate that more with their experience of um, te urawera and uh, food sovereignty and justice. Thank you very much. Cool. Okay, cool name, Mara, Atara. Oh, well, kia ora mai tato. Um, just making sure whether Olivia can share our screen. Yep, Kate the Pai just doing transition things. Oh, wow. Well. No, cool. Ka pai. Kia ora, everyone. Um, my name is Erin Matariki Ka, and um, this is Tami Iti. It's a pleasure to sit next to uh, Tami today and share with you all. Um, so I am of, uh, we're both of Tuhoi descent. I'm also Ngāti Awa, I'm also Welsh and English and Croatian in my whakapapa genealogy. So kia ora to all of you out there who are in those lands as well. Um, so up on our screen here, I'm just going to share a little bit and Tami and I will talk about Te Uruwera. So Te Uruwera is a, uh, a, a rainforest. And on the screen, you'll be able to see our country of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And on the right-hand side there, you'll be able to see Te Uruwera is the grey kind of marking there um, in what we call Te Manama or Te Ika a Maui, the heart of the fish of Maui, the North Island of New Zealand. So um, Te Uruwera in 2014 was granted legal personality. Um, and thank you so much, Kathy, for uh, your awesome introduction. We're just going to pick up on a lot of the points that you've made there. So um, she, she as, a, as a forest, is quite different, distinct from a river um, because it's one big territory. And within that legal personhood of the rainforest, um, she owns herself. So all of the land that is uh, that is that makes up uh, Te Uruwera establishment land has been vested within Te Uruwera herself and um, no human owns her, right? And then there's a board that's been appointed to speak on her behalf, which is also distinct from the Whanganui River example that um, that Kathy shared. So the board that has been appointed has nine people. Six of them are from Tuhoi, uh, from our iwi, our tribe, and three of them are from the Crown. So I just want to pick up on a few things that Kathy sort of shared. And I think what it's really important when we talk about law, <laughs> We think of law as relationships. So how do we relate to each other? And how do we relate to the whenua, to the land? So um, it's a worldview. We need to understand that this Western perspective that is globalized and taken over through colonization is just one worldview and alongside very many others, including a Tuhoi worldview. So from a, a Western colonial uh, legal system worldview, the land is something we relate to each other as owners or shareholders of a land, and we relate to the land as a resource which we manage, that we own. Okay, from a Tuhoi perspective, ownership of land is arrogant, and I purposely use that word as a provocative word. It is arrogant. It is a superiority complex as a human to feel like an owner of the land, and that is because we are, we are from the land. The land was here long before we were. She is our mother, a papatuanuku, 
and we are her children. So it would be, it doesn't fit then to then be an owner and a manager of something that is so complex and so large and so giving. Oh, here's a beautiful photo of our, of our whenua of our land, of Waikare Moana. So it doesn't work. And so legal personhood is, is a wonderful tool that we're able to use within our Western legal system, which is our dominant legal system here in Aotearoa, to introduce and be able to legislate for our perspective. Because in that, we have legislation that says, no, the land owns herself, and we are simply caretakers. So instead of being owners of the land, we have responsibilities to the land. And what does that look like? So Te Uruwera Board, who's the voice of the land, has produced what's called Te Kawa o Te Uruwera, which is known as the management plan. And I encourage all of you out there watching to have a look for Te Kawa o Te Uruwera on, um, on the internet. There's a copy online there for you to look through. And you'll notice that instead of resource management in there, we talk about human management. So we flip it. So instead of us assuming uh, to be able to manage land as a resource, we actually say, well, no, the land's been here forever. The pressure that's coming on the land in terms of climate change, peak oil, food insecurity is actually coming from the actions of the humans, of us. So we need to manage the humans. The land, she can do her own thing. We'll manage ourselves and our impact on the land in order to be able to care for and take responsibility for the land. So what does that look like? Um, in Te Kawa, you'll read it as like, it's a beautiful document to read through. Uh, it's a motive. It's not set up like a scientific thing. And you'll notice that one of the first things that we, we ask uh, of ourselves is to be honest about our impact on the land as humans. And to be honest about the fact that we are colonized. And I think that hits home for a lot of people, a lot of Indigenous peoples and all, through, all throughout the world. As colonised peoples, we need to reassess uh, what it is that we have absorbed from this Western lens of being owners and extracting from the land and, and return to and reconnect with our ability to be intimate with the land and have relationship with the land as a child to a mother. So what does that mean? And that's for us to uncover now that we are able to start decolonizing ourselves, start to work on ourselves. It really comes down to that relationship of love, of aroha and connection and feeling that connection with the whenua. So um, how does that connect with our kai? I think it has everything to do with our kai. When we plant food, in the ground and we have that relationship of our hands in the soil, we are intimately connected. And then when we eat that food from the land that we care for, it becomes a part of us. And therefore we become more connected to the land physically. And just that relationship of aroha and of feeding and of sharing, we start to rebuild our sense of self, our sense of connection to the whenua and our ability to to really be intimate and understand our impact on the whenua. So um, I think when I think about that, then I think less imposition on the land, which is, is really a colonial kind of tool where we plan out and we impose things on the land and more about understanding and allowing to unfold and slowing down and caring for the land. And so, um, uh, I'll leave I'll leave that there for those those Picardo there, and I just want to um, to pass on to to pass on to uh, Tame, and to talk about what does uh, a tuhoi perspective when we look at Te Uruwera, we look at our kai, what does it mean to have that mana motu hake, that uh, independence, that um, connection with the land? What does it mean to have be a child of the land? Uh, 
na wa wa ta re pa tu te ra ni e ke pa ni ku e ke tang roa ha mi e wi e ta i ki e thank you hey um um uh, tu hoi uh, raising tu hoi but also i'm um, uh, on their mother on their mother's side i'm connected to darawa in rotorua uh from makitu to tongariro and uh, and also on my mother's state side there in Waikato, he piko he tangifa. Um, when you when you see the image of the mapping of the Uruwela, in the Uruwela is um, as you can see there is a uh, twice the size of Auckland area, and um, so the Uruwela I guess for me you know is a it's a it's a living being. It is the Wanui Atani. The Wanui Atani Tani is the Kaichaki, Kwaya the the guardian, the Atua, the spiritual guardian of, of the Uru of, of the Uruwera. The Uruwera are an intricate part of the whole of Papatuanu of our Mother Earth. So for a child of the Uruwera, for us there. Is is um you know you learn these things as you grow up. As a child, I always remember because um because every every part, if you look at the at the bush itself, uh, every part of the Uruwa. So if you look at that, you can see that now, and you look at every corner, every ridge have a name to it. So every lako and every plant and every tree have a name to it. So it is the home of different places. So the further you go in there. Uh, only a Pacific Araka or tree will go in there. But in my particular part, of, I live down on the northern end of the Uruwera. Uh, it's, a, it's a main interest. I come from the, from the Ruatoki area. Uh, we are the border people. So our role from the northern end of the Uruwera, uh, we, are, we are the Kaitaki of the border lines. Uh, and because we are in the inland, so most of our kai and and our, our kai are in the bush. Um, so prior to the arrival of the Great Migration in 1300, in fact, we didn't have any kai. We didn't have the gardens. Well, the Uruwera is the gardens. So you got the manu, you got the birds, you got the fish, uh, you got the, the tuna and all of that. So then a lot, a lot of these places that we come on Manu and then there, so, so we learn as a child uh, that that particular part, they, they are seasonal food. And so you have the, um, so you need to know, to understand the growth of the middle. And uh, they only, they, the middle only, the only, you only do your hunting and the gathering of the, the certain time of the year. And so for the middle, and uh, and it's a it's, it's a great big Christmas for the birds, and, and in particular for the uh, the kereru, the kaka, and all of that. And then there's an abundance of food. So around about April, around about April, and uh, during that period of time, just abundance of food. And so they didn't really need the garden. So we didn't plant the UI and all of that. The kumara they came later on. And so we, so we really, depending on the, the lower of the, um, of the wetlands. So you have the wetlands, so do you have the wetlands. Those are the places. So a lot of those, a lot of those places are particularly designated for particular whānau or family. Mm -hmm. They are the food gatherers. Not everybody do that. Everybody have a specific skills and responsibility. And so they, they are quite different to the northern end. Up, up to the inland, so in right in the middle of the Uruwera, totally different again. And so only those people there, you only get certain food around there, because they, they don't they don't have middle way, way back in certain places of the Uruwera. And so because that's because some, some part of the Uruwera are too cold and all of that. So they, they been, so we, we depended on each other around the whole of the Uruwera. And so, uh, and particularly around on the lake on the, um, on the southern, on the eastern southern area of the Uruwera, is that uh, different terrains and uh, different style. Even the language is uh, quite different. And uh, although it's too hoi, but uh, the way the flow. Uh, so that 
the whole of the Urdu is an intricate part, not just the language, uh, because the the birds do speak the ancient language. So our language come from that. The, the language come from from the Nahiri, from the Urdu era. Uh, uh, even the e even the shape of your physical body uh, also intricate. So the body had to be you got to be able to walk because a lot of climbing hills. So we're little we we bit like a little short ass like me, uh, a little like a, a goat. So we got to have you got to have a body that able to kind of keep up with it. And so um, it's it's a big responsibility. But when in thirteen hundred, when the arrival of the uh, of the Polynesian migration they arrive here, there, so they meet up with the uh, what the Hapuoni only the Na Portuguese. They are the original people. So they introduce a new food, the new kind. They bought the kumara, they bought the banana, they had to go planting bananas. Mm -hmm. Certain part they didn't work out too well. <laughs> so, so they so they mainly are the kumara they, they bought around there. So and when they start putting the kai they bought from another place and put it in the ground, it created another part of the chicken and the cover uh, in the area. And so, so, and these things are covered in chicken uh, in the rules and the regulations and that we kind of put together uh, uh, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I guess that I'm um, listening to the legal part of it. And uh, my view around, uh, around that is really, is really important. And I see that the, uh, the, the Uruwela, the Uruwela Act is uh, uh, based on the ancient story. Black warrior or the and uh, and the rules of the of the treaty or the law uh, need to be implemented to protect uh, and to add on there and making sure that the um, that the law itself uh, in in um, connect and uh, and making so they need to be so we we work on that and having this conversation bringing another language. Uh, another real, another set of chicken and cover, and um, so we got that, and, and uh, Aaron talk about that, and uh, so um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, there's so much that we can do, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. We, we pull a lot of nuts and bolts, and that we need to put together, and uh, we got this, we got this uh, Uruwera Act there. Uh, but we need to work more on that. Uh, we need to put something that can make sense to, to you know, to the people on the field, to the people on the land. We can have all of this active, but we need to have more conversation. What that look like, right. and does it make sense? And what is it, you know? And uh, so we we need to have this ongoing conversation. So we so we come a long way from being pushed out. So we've been huge changes, and uh, and so the the treaty settlement and all of that, and the implementation of the Uruwera Act is is it's just an, another shape and form, and uh, for us to be able to to have some understanding, I guess both ways. So um, uh, that's about it. I think. Yeah, Kelda mm Hi. -hmm. So um, just in rounding up. Some of those Fakaro there, what's um what's really clear is that there are two legal systems, okay? There's the Western colonial legal system and there's the Kawa and the Tikanga, which is what uh, uh Thami is, is explaining, that intimacy with the land and and our decolonization and our search for sovereignty, for Manamotu Hake, and for food sovereignty and justice, it's it's these things are coming together with legal personality are actually a, 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 a tool that's enabling us to really be able to connect with our kawa and our tikanga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as Tommy is saying, we're still in early days. It's 2014 for us and 2017 for Te Uruwera and 2017 for Whanganui. So we're still exploring how these things are coming together. And as, as Tommy is saying, what we need to be learning and returning to what are our values? How do we connect with the whenua? And kai, our food, is a really beautiful way to do that. Yeah, and uh, and, and I guess, um, I mean, the key the key element for me really having a relationship. Good. You have to have this relationship. We, we can see things. What is my relationship to do? To, 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 what does it mean to me? 
Yeah. And, uh, and so I got to be able to understand every particle parts, the cells, every, every part. The Uruwera is it's just like our body. You have a heart, you know, you have, uh, um, you know, you have eyes and ears, you have a voice. And, uh, and, and the, the Uruwera speak. So the voices come from the, from the children of Tani. And uh, and I think that we we need to live in it. We we it's, it's not just uh, it's all in the head. And so I, I I need people. We need to be able just to lie there, have a sleep, and feeling okay about it. You know, and and having that relationship. And um and how do we bring the next generation to participate? And how do we bring? The, the bulk of our population that are living away from the land. So we got a very small group of people still maintaining the mana, uh, maintaining the um, the authority and keeping that in order and, uh, and and having this conversation. So it's a participation of the hapu of the different clans uh, right around in the whole of the of the Uruwela. So we but it's a lot of work, and you know? it's a lot of work there to 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 try and, and maintain that relationship. To try and, and maintain the conversation, uh, we got to rearrange our whole thinking. You know, we, um, we got to ship away from looking at part of our land uh, B sixteen. You know, the quarter. Mm -hmm. So we need to talk about the fucker papa. What is the genealogy? So we need to go back to the ancient time to our old era because that's where our future is. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at the Uruwera, the Uruwera is the ancient come from way back, but it also is the future. And so the future for the Uruwera is that we that, that's what we're doing. So I, I guess that the um uh the act itself is the future. We're make, making sure that the Uruwera is part of the future. Oh. And, uh, and and maintain the strength, the colour, the smell. The smell of the hino, mm. the taste of the uh, the taste of the nico, the taste of the cabbage tree, oh. the coca, uh, all of that. So it, it have a taste to it, it have a smell to it, and it have beautiness in it. And so it, because and also the healer, and so the Uruwera is the healer. And so for most two who are they're living out in the big smoke here in Auckland, they always return home. My fruit just to lay back there and to heal, and you know, and uh, so most people go to the beach and uh, <laughs> down to the sunshine and uh, hang around in the uh, in the foreshore. But for most two way, it's going back to the Uruwera, and going back to the Uruwera is to be in touch. It's the homeland. Mm -hmm. It's the homeland of our ancestor, mm -hmm. and uh, we are connected to that. Oh. Kelda, I'm just seeing some of these um, questions are popping up on our screen and I'll just have a quick read through and we'll, we might have a go at answering some of them and some of them are also for Kathy, so we'll, we'll balance that out. Yeah. Um, one of the parts I, uh, Uncle, that's come up is about ownership. So yes. how do we think that we can challenge this notion of ownership on a large scale? And an economic system that's based on ownership and nature as a resource to be exploited. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a big one. You know, I'm 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 working with the with the bees. I'm a bee a beekeeper, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm not I'm I'm just part and parcel of a company. Uh, and um, it's a it's a big discussion. You know, and um, you know, shifting our thinking of the land. You know, I mean, it's shifting uh, taking away that. Um, the colonial mentality, or I'm a shareholder, you know, I got uh, I got twenty percent, you know, um, I got my percentage from my grandfather and my grandmother. We need to shift that away, mm -hmm. you know. So we need to have a better understanding, having this relationship, mm -hmm. and so um, I'm one of the other drivers, of driving people to shift their thinking mm -hmm. away from that, and uh, so. Yeah, we're going to take a little while, but we need to have this conversation and ship it away. So at the moment, um, you know, it's a, it's a really bad habit that's going around within our community about that. You know, and um, many of us are really concerned about that. And um, But so we have, we have this conversation around that. And so at the moment, we're shifting away from rather having the individual interest 
So we've been here under a partner, a partner trust. That's the start. So hopefully we don't really need a trust. Mm -hmm. So we need to, so we really need, the next generation need to be brought up into a, a different frame of mind. Mm -hmm. So they're not thinking I am a shareholder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a relationship mm -hmm. to my mother, to my grandmother, yeah. because it's a female element. The mother is, it's a female element. What is me as a male is Paka Papa to that. So I'm from Rani, there's a male element, I'm that. And to my mother, to my sister, to my auntie, to my nanny. Yeah. So we treat it. So we had to treat, we had to treat the land like that. It is a human. It is like us. The mother used to like us. So in our practice, so we had to teach their kids there when they go into the night. So we it's the, the Pani had to sacrifice his children to cut him down on the tree. You don't just go down and cut the tree there, you know, to make a lot of money. And they have a purpose. And so you you ask Tani and you have your karakia, you have your pai kōrero, mm -hmm. and because Tani had to let go of some of these children. Mm -hmm. And then you chop it down, they have, you have your rituals, and you have your karakia, and uh, making sure that's also that's also an intricate part of our practice. Yeah. So you don't just go down with a chainsaw and cut a whole lot of trees without having a discussion with everybody mm -hmm. and you sell it out to big companies. Yeah. That's a no-no. No. So we so we, we need to be vigilant about all of that, mm -hmm. even ourselves there, yeah, and even just going down and chopping just for the sake of it, you just can't do that. Yeah. And even the kind the killing of the birds, all that are the intricate part of it of our of our Papa. Uh, yes, uh, to me, the dream is that one day Papa Tuonuku do not own by anybody. No. Yeah, but there's a place that we can share with the world. Yeah. So me as a Tuhu, me as a Waikato Arawa, yes, I will share our space mm. for the human race so we can able to share that. So, um, yeah, waiting on that. Yeah. Yeah. Tautoko in a Zoo. Again, just returning to so with ownership, and there was another question about private property, things like this. I think what we have to recognise is that those are Western legal perspectives yes. that have become normalised. Yeah, so that's gets. our normal, yeah. And we only kind of think that way. We're actually one of our biggest issues is a as our imagination. Yes. We've been limited by this colonisation and imposition of a, of a colonial legal system has limited our ability to actually see how else we can relate to the whenua, to the land. So when it comes to ownership and private property and we think, oh, there's all these limitations, there's enforceable laws, we need to remember that's just one world view. Yes. And we need to remember, and actually maybe this is part of it, look back at our history, how did that worldview form? It's actually grounded in, in violence. It's grounded in uh, Roman co colonization of Europe and the spread of that, the doctrine of discovery, um, which is a very important uh, history for us to really start looking into of how that, that those thinking, those ways of, of relating to the earth spread across the world and overtook the, the worldviews that Tami yeah. is uh, sharing with us. So if we can realize that that is just one way and we have our ability to re uh, remember how we relate to the earth. Um, so one example that I use of, of a kawa that uh, Tami actually taught me was when you're standing in the ocean and you're, you're collecting kaimon or seafood, say you collect some pippies or some shellfish, you're not to eat that in, whilst you're standing in the ocean. And why is that? Because the ocean, tangaroa, is our ancestor this food that he's gifted us is uh, his children. And so to eat that, those, that kai or that food while standing within the ocean is a total breach of the relationship that we have, that reciprocal relationship that we have with the ocean. It is more tika or more correct to take that food, return to the shore, and there you can enjoy the food. And if you can take that story and think about well, what does that tell us about our relationship with nature, our respect and reciprocity, and instead of owning the rights or, or uh, feeling this sort of superiority where we can just take and take and take, we're actually recognising in our actions and our practice how to relate. And we teach our children that. 
And so as Tame is saying, it's a new generation of, of kids that can come up and they learn these histories and they learn that actually our way of doing things isn't oppressed and suppressed and gone. It is there to be lived. And for our way of, of connecting with the whenua and with our food has all of this richness in it that we need to just bring back to live. Yeah. What do you yeah, think? yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and just to add on that, you know, our children are intricate, but our grandchildren are an intricate part of it. And then, when, then we, we need to focus more around that because uh, there is hope for us. Um, and bringing our mokopuna, our grandchildren, and also bringing a lot of our, our because there's, there's, there's going to be a big shift. There's going to be a big, uh, uh, a big movement of people moving back. But we need to be prepared for that. The thing is, when we people move back, uh, many of us been away from home for the last sixty, nearly hundred years. In fact, yeah. and uh, so we, so when people go back home, the problem that when people come home, they've been other bad habits, unusual habits, and so we we get to make sure that when people do come home, uh, they need they need they need to be a process and making sure that and safe for them too. So, you know, we don't want people to come in and get in, you know, slap around the for certain doing things they don't know. Mm -hmm. So we're really important that we have this uh, a process that we are able to, to chat to, you know, to our whānau. Mm -hmm. uh, we come, so we, we do need, we do need our people to come on sooner or later because there is a big shift uh, because what's been happening last year on uh, the, uh, the COVID, oh, okay. uh, there's a, it's a huge is a huge thing so so we need to to be prepared and work around that yeah kia ora. and just looking at some of these other questions here and comments here's to normalizing the maori worldview in the uk <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and as as kathy says we were all pagan you know we're all based in nature and i think this is probably the importance again of understanding looking back at our history how did we get to this place where we are we have extracted so much from the earth that we are now risking our survival as a species. You know, where did that come from? Understanding all of the different, uh, so the doctrine of discovery, even the witch hunts for 400 years of really annihilating the uh, European indigenous and pagan rituals of connection with the land and how that translated into colonization of, of our lands um, and Turtle Island and all these places. So I think, the more we can talk and have these conversations as we are, the more we're going to actually realize that our bodies and our wairua, our spirits and our, our way is connected with the earth and our joy is actually connected with the earth. And as we start to build that intimacy in our relationship again, it's not just a Māori worldview. I think these yeah. perspectives are, are universal, actually. And I think that's a lot of what this conference is covering is, um, is recognition of these these relationships and the need to return to this more slower world of connection and of love um, between the human and, and the whenua um, and stop the superiority complex of extraction and yeah. resources. Uh, oh. Yeah, and, uh, just my, my background is farming. I come from a uh, farming, farming, farming background and uh, a, a, a lot of the... Um, uh, a lot of the farming was uh, implemented during when they had the first Māori and peace, like this Apirana Nata and all that. So they come up with all the ideas of new thoughts and new new ideas came from, from Parliament. And so they, they thought that uh, all the damn natives and they ought to be farmers. So what did they do? So they chopped down all the trees, clear them in, and they clear all the, all the wetlands, drain all the, all, 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 all the drains and... Uh, what uh, to have. So farming didn't really happen for us in, in a big way uh, till in the, uh, just prior to the Second World War. So our family been involved in milking cows before the machine or the and, and all that around about in 1930. And um, yeah, yeah, so each of that, but there's a lot of damage. And then, uh, you know, the, 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 the land has been damaged by the use of the uh, of the poison, you know, the teenagers and all of that. And, uh, uh, and uh, there, are things, there are some things that I, uh, I just can't believe that they, 
the kind of stuff that we, as a child, we we had all this chemical there, and they get us there to go and kill all the all the ragwoods and, and all the uh, all the other weeds there on the farm. But we had no ideas, and I, um, I remember throwing buckets of uh, of the poison down down the drain, get rid of it. You know, there, there was no supervision and monitoring what he's as a kids what what was doing. Terrible, you know, and. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I'm glad that they are changing the law in the Regional Management Act and all the regional council and all the implementation of that and in working with Tana Tapenua, uh, making sure that the implementation of the Tikana and the Kawa uh, are, are being, um, uh, being put together and making sure that, um, that as a farmer, and then making sure that if you're going to do bring other new products, uh, you you need you need to um, you know you got you need to get permission. So there's, there's a need to be some monitoring, some control, supervision around that the use of this. Um, but I, I think that the farming industry. I'm not saying don't farm. I'm just, I think we we just need to look at it another way and how we can uh, work around that. Uh, rather than milking a thousand cows, and uh, all for mass produce, mass production, so we we need to have a uh, a better conversation around these things. Kapai, kapai. <laughs> Hi again. Um, so did you want me to answer some of these other questions? I can just give some really brief ones. Cool. Um, yeah. I can there was a question about the status. Oh, sorry, is someone else talking? Oh, um, it sounds very So um, whether a status um, for legal personhood can be given in other countries, and I was saying, yes, it has been already. I've actually got a video, um, an hour-long, or they're about 45-minute long presentation that's on YouTube um, for Vermont, a, a presentation I gave to Vermont Law School, and it gives some four examples for different rivers around the world, um, Ecuador, India, Colombia, and the one I just talked about today. Um, so that, uh, I mean, we could find the link, but you could have searched for my talk for at uh, Vermont Law School on YouTube. Um, but, and since then, since I gave that talk, it was two years ago. There has been there have been cases about uh, where the Colombian, I think, Supreme or Constitutional Court has awarded or recognised legal personality for the Amazon rainforest um, in some climate cases. So it has been done, and various other municipalities are doing it in the USA. It's been done in all sorts of different ways around the world, which is one of the slides I alluded to. Uh, so yeah, it can be done. It's just a matter of what best suits your circumstance, what can be achieved in your country. So in relation to the question about the uh, the Ganges, um, the River Ganga and the other uh, rivers in India, oh, I forgot to mention Bangladesh. Well, now that's been recognised too by court. Um, so it had there was an argument made and lots of people, oh, I don't know why people seem to think as soon as you say, oh, we, this river has rights, it's like, well, are we going to sue it for drowning or for flooding, you know? <laughs> and I don't know why people think of that automatically. And that was a problem with the Indian court. It was an argument made, well, you can't, uh, you can't give this a legal person, make it a legal person, because then what are we going to do about flooding, especially out of district, right? Um, then who's responsible? And so I, th I think maybe the best comparison is with children. Children have rights, right? but we don't make them legally responsible for everything they do. We consider there's an age of responsibility, right? There's a capability there. I think we could do the same for rivers. We could see them as we have all the responsibilities towards them, right? But And they may have rights in that sense to be cared for, to have people responsible for it, but we don't make them responsible because we don't consider them capable in that sense. We don't consider them aware enough of their the consequences of their actions that that should incur liability for flooding, for example. So I don't. I think it's our own mindsets that are creating those problems. So the way we see the world, and if we saw it differently, we wouldn't even worry about it. So I think the Indian courts were wrong, respectfully, to worry about that in the first place. You just need some different arguments. Um, and in relation to 
just a very brief comment on capitalism, uh, that question there, um, how can you challenge the notion of ownership? Although even if we can't do it all in one fell swoop, you can't just say, right, we're getting rid of ownership in one day, but you can impose responsibility. You can impose responsibility in law. You know, we've just had this unbridled capitalism, right? We've had unbridled ownership. It's like all rights, no care. And people in this idea of liberalism and neoliberalism. Uh, I mean, these are just, I know, I know they see most of our lifetimes, right? But they're blips, short blips in human history and even shorter blips in the history of the world, like history of Te Urawera, right? Um, as Tame was saying, you know, it's we're just here for a short time and you have to think of it in the bigger picture. It's a very unusual set of circumstances that has led to neoliberalism today, right? And we're all just being selfish and people are being selfish and they just make up a theory to justify doing what they feel like doing. That's really all it comes down to. And you need to bridle people a little bit more. It's like, we're not all so special. <laughs> I don't know how you can tell that to me. We're not all so special. <laughs> we need to get away from that and think of our duties more than our rights. And I think that will infuse all of these discussions about food and sovereignty and actually continuing the natural world. As we say, we're not going to, we don't want to destroy it all and then have no food. <laughs> um, awesome. Yes, completely agree with, I mean, everything you've said. And thank you so much, Tami and Erin, for that absolutely incredible presentation. We've had a lot of really beautiful comments coming through from the Crowdcast, a lot of appreciative people out there. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. Um, we've run quite quite a ways over time because everyone was just so keen to hear more of what we we're all saying. Um, uh, so we'd better wrap up now-ish, but if, if there's anything else that, that any of you guys uh, would like to say or get across to to our lovely listeners all around the world, then um, now's your chance. And thank you for that. And uh, I, I hope that we had a further conversation. I, I think it's um, the way the world are moving and shifting. We, we need to have uh, more of this corridor uh, and, uh, globally. And uh, we are part of the globe. So we need to learn from each other. And so thank you to the audience and to the, to the listeners out there. And, uh, and uh, hopefully that we have this call again in the near future. Kia ora. Kia ora, Kia ora. Kia ora Kia ora. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, especially Olivia. Thank you. Thank you.